Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another of our sort of RQT uh, webinars. Today, we're looking at managing SEND in the mainstream classroom to so a follow on session from a previous session um, that we had hosted by Pioneer Trust. Now, with that um, session, it was recorded. It's up on YouTube already. You'll find that this session, as all of our sessions, will be recorded and posted up on our YouTube site. So you can obviously tune back in. So if you search Chilton Teaching School Hub on YouTube, you'll be able to find those. Throughout today's session, you might want to ask questions, engage in some conversation. If you wish to do so, you'll find there's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says chat. By all means, type away in there and we'll pick up any questions or comments that you have. Um, I'm going to pass over to Coralie, who will take us through tonight's session. I'm just going to start sharing the screens with you now. Thank you, James. Um, hi, I'm Coralie Bordiak. I'm the um, Inclusion Manager at um, Chantry Primary Academy, a large primary mainstream school in Luton. I'm also a specialist leader for inclusion and can support schools and work with other schools to develop their SEN. Um, some of you might have um, seen the session that Nicola Conban delivered, I believe it was earlier in January. She talked to you about identifying SEN in the mainstream classroom. So this is kind of a follow on session from that, maybe going through some of the bits that she went through that I, th I think are important to recap and looking at some strategies to support children within the classroom. OK, so I just kind of wanted to start um, talking about the SEN situation um, across the country at the moment and moving on from having identified that a child has special needs, that bit where Nekka is at, as to where you go. And, and what you do now. So um, special needs went through lots of changes back in 2014. So the language around special needs changed. One of the big focuses to come out of that was that the responsibility for children with special needs lays with the teacher, that every child, every teacher is a teacher is sent is, is the phrase that you will hear. And that um, class teachers are accountable for SEN children just like they are with all all of the other children within their school. The other big change was statements that were EHC education healthcare plans, statements all transferred into EHCPs. So your EHCPs are for children with, with the highest level of need within your school. At the moment, that's roughly 3.7% on average. That's an increasing figure. It was, I think, 2.8 last year. So they are your neediest of children. Um, the rest of your children are known as K. They're, they're, they're on SIMS, they're, they're registered as K. So they're your children who need additional support. They need something different above quality first teaching. So they are children that you've identified have got special needs through those ways that Nicola talked to you about. And they are children that you would work with within, within the classroom. The neediest of those children who meet a, a higher threshold would then be your education healthcare plan children. The needs are broken up into various areas, communication and interaction, cognition and learning, social, emotional, mental health and physical needs. They are then often broken down into further categories and different diagnoses will fit into those different categories. But on the whole, they are your four main areas of special need. For example, autism would move between two at times, communication and interaction and social and emotional. And I think you often have got to talk with your senko about what's the biggest presenting factor with those children. A really common misconception um, that staff still have, but parents often have, is that as soon as you get a diagnosis, you're entitled to an education healthcare plan. That used to be the way sometimes with statements, but the decision to have an education healthcare plan is based on the need of that child rather than an entitlement or that they have got a diagnosis. We've got many children within our school who've got a diagnosis of autism and who do not have EHCPs. We've got a number that do, um, but they can be supported by the usual classroom, practice, classroom practices that support rather than with an education healthcare plan. And equally, we've got children who have no diagnosis who do have an education healthcare plan. So an education healthcare plan 
is really based on the needs of that child and 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 the support they need and a, a lot of work is goes into getting an education healthcare plan you've got to prove outside agency involvement you've got to prove how much support that that child needs you've got to prove that that supports a long-term support need rather than a, than a short-term thing and they're agreed by the local authority so it's a discussion between school outside agencies often educational psychologists and the local authority and then they are awarded by the local authority and you have set targets and you'll have outside by the agencies who can support you in writing those targets and then that's reviewed every year so when you've identified that a child has special needs and you've gone through that process you look at the support they need and then that's how you how the written kind of structure around them goes within the school can i have the next slide please thank you so um, outside agencies, I know some of you were talking with Nicola about this and there were some questions about outside agencies. Different authorities will have different outside agencies that you can use. And as I say, different schools will have access to different agencies and different areas and authorities will have different agencies, but on, on a whole, these are the agencies. So you'll have educational psychologists they come into school and they help you assess a child's need and they give advice to you to follow within school. They're usually for the more complex cases. Um, they'll come in typically and do an observation or I, I, EPs will come in and do an observation on that child within the classroom. They'll meet with the parent. They'd like to meet with the teacher. They probably meet with your Senko and they talk through with you the, the, the life experience for that child, as it were. What is school really like for them? They do some assessments and some standardised scoring. And then they would work with you to write some targets for that child and some strategies that you, you can put in place. And as I say, they're normally for kind of your more complex case children. And typically, if you want to take a child forward for an EHCP, for example, you'd have had an educational psychologist in. And they're there to help you um, solve your, your the problems, as it were, and, and often can give you a fresh update on things. And some children will see, be seen by an educational psychologist once. Sometimes they'll be seen um, a number of times. So we've had, got a child now, for example, who's just been assessed in year three. And she says, I want you to go and do this and I, I will come back in year four. The educational psychologist or EPs also will um, give you training. They will, can deliver interventions so they can, can deliver sound play or play therapy to children as well and they can use also a good resource to have. Um, you then have paediatricians, so they're doctors. And is give a diagnosis based. So who you would go to if you thought a child had um, ADHD or autism or global delay, um, they can be referred to by doctors or by speech therapists or by health visitors. But typically, if the child's of school age, they really want the referral to come from school. So if you've got a child in your class who you think is showing a number of autistic traits or who has a number of traits of ADHD, then you can work with the parents to make a referral to the paediatricians and they can give you advice. Um, and a diagnosis if there is one. Our paediatricians in Luton, um, the Edwin Lobo Centre, will um, have developed a pathway, so you can have an ADHD pathway and an autism pathway. And the job is to diagnose, and if they have for ADHD, or they will carry on seeing you. If it's an autism diagnosis they're going to give you, then they would give you that diagnosis, maybe follow up with one session and then pass you on to other agencies to be supported. Sometimes for some children, they stay involved long term. But if there's a diagnosis to be made, then often they will come in, give the diagnosis and then signpost you elsewhere. You then also have specialist advisors um, in, in all sorts of areas who are much like educational psychologists. They come into school, they give you assessments, they do observations. They'll sometimes diagnose things, for example, like selective mutism. You can have speech and communication advisors who will come in and diagnose 
for you. Um, again, they will work with you, they'll observe the child and they'll talk you through the strategies that you've got in place and then um, other strategies that you can use and they can come in and review those with you if you need to. CAMH, um, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service is, is for children's mental health. Typically, um, CAMH is for like those really high level mental health needs, although in some areas, including Luton, they're starting to branch in school support for, for lower level mental health needs they also will offer you group sessions um, and, and they can work alongside school so you might have somebody in your school who, who will work with CAMH and they will deliver one-to-one -one sessions or work with parents all to do with developing children's mental health they also can diagnose um, autism or ADHD in children that are older in Luton um, so you, you'll also have speech and language therapists who do what their name is. Um, they will deliver speech and language. They will come in and again and do assessments um, or they will do assessments at clinics and they will put together a program of support. Often that is expected to be delivered by school. So you might have somebody in your school who will deliver that or um, a TA who might deliver that. And they'll also give work for you to do at home. In some cases, they will deliver blocks of sessions. So they will say, um, we're going to come and see you every week or we're going to come and see you every month. And they will work depending on the need of the child. So an autistic child with an EHCP, for example, might have a speech and language therapist come in once a month to give them advice. Um, I haven't differentiated it there, I apologise. We have local behaviour provisions in Luton. So we've got four behaviour provisions across the town. Um, they are specialists in behaviour. You can refer to them um, to ask for support within your school or to ask for training, to ask for observations, or they, um, our local area also has, has a provision that children can go in and work in if they need to. And they will support schools to keep those children within um, the mainstream environment. You also then have lots and lots of private companies who will do all of those things above. So you'll have private counsellors or private speech therapists. You'll also have different types of therapies that they can offer. So, for example, we've just had a child who's um, done some therapy with a company called Pause, who offered dog therapy for a child and, and worked on his, some of his social and emotional needs and mental health needs with him with a dog. There's an, a group called Seeds of Change who work with horses and equine therapy. So we've worked with those people and they're private companies that you can fund from the school themselves. So outside agencies are really important to, to, to support those children with higher level needs and to give you advice on the interventions that you put in place. Typically, they will tell you as a school what it is that you need to do. So you'd be going to them for advice. They don't necessarily always offer all the therapy all the work themselves they will work with you with the school to deliver the support for those children can i have the next slide please thank you um so i spoke a moment ago about teachers responsibilities and i know nicholas talked to you about some of these things so just to recap as teachers the role of the class teacher according to the sen code of practice is to measure and monitor the ongoing progress in learning and behaviour and personal and social development for children with SEN as you would with all your other children so it is they the SEN children are like all, all of the other children um, it's a teacher's role to identify and the re reduce the barriers so what can you do to help them overcome that barrier what can you put in place and to differentiate to adapt the curriculum as much as possible to allow those children to access the curriculum with a school. And I, I know that can be a really hard area sometimes because we are mainstream schools, um, we, we have certain limitations. So it's adapting things as much as possible to allow children access and to allow them to, to, to learn from their education based on their need within the, within the school themselves. Um, the teaching standards say that we need to have a clear understanding of all the pupils, including those with special needs. And that, um, again, every teacher is, is, is a teacher of SEND. And, and we need to look at those children as we look at all of the children in our class, 
yes, your Senko is there to help you. Yes, they are there to support you, but their job is to support you and to, to help you get the right things in place, not to deliver all of that intervention yourself. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so um, starting to talk about strategies um, and the things that we can put in place. I think one of the biggest barriers that we see is that staff and families and the community will, will put limits on a child and they'll say, oh, they can't do this, they can't do that. And we really focus on their difficulties and why they find things difficult. Whereas actually, we need to believe that a child can be whatever they want to be. And we need that child to believe that they can be whatever they want to be. And it's about finding what they're good at and using that and helping them to, to, to find their difficult, to find the positives in their difficulty. And you might find reading really, really hard, but you're really good at art. So how can we use art to help you do this? How can we use those creative skills that you've got in your reading? And really helping to build the children's confidence because when they believe that they can do something, then they will feel much better in themselves. And then they, they, they will have a real go at it. So it's, it's that real power of yet. It's, it's what can you do? What, what are you capable of? So can you just, to have a break from my voice, um, think of one of the children within your classroom who, who has special needs, who has a difficulty. And could you just think of something that they are really good at and, and how they might be able to, to use that strength? And if you could just pop that into the chat or something that a, a child in your class who has a special need, what is one of those areas that they're really good at? Help them to identify one of their strengths. Yeah, I think that's great, Michelle. Finding what the child's good at. We've got an autistic child. Um, she loves snails. So we made everything about snails. She counted snails. She wrote instructions about snails. She had real social difficulties. So um, we taught her how to be caring for the snails and we use snails to calm her down. I, I think finding that that love is a, is a really important thing. And I think using that to help her feel, to help the child feel less stressed about the learning environment is a really positive way. And I think trying to remove that ceiling so they can do it. They are just as able to read as, as the other children. Yes, they might find it hard, but they are able to do those things. And, and we talk in school about these examples that I've got there of, children, of um, adults that the children might well know who've got difficulties. Richard Branson um, talks very openly about his difficulties and, and, and he's a great example of what can be achieved. Um, Michael Phelps, again, he'll talk very openly about his difficulties and how he channels that into um, his swimming and, and that amazing career that he's had. Yeah, I think Michelle, that's, that, that, that's another great example. They're really great at telling stories. So let's focus on that. Let, let's get them confident with their English. Let's get them confident with their language. And we can, that, that, that's the basis of it all. At, at um, Chantry, we do talk for writing. So we spend a lot of time talking about what we're gonna write. And, and having a real basis for those things is really important. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and, and James, the, the comic strips, for finding what it is they like, helping them feel more confident in those areas and taking away some of that pressure is, is a really important thing. Um, can you do the next slide for me, please? Okay, so there's just some specific examples there of, of the growth mindset and inclusion. Um, I, I, th I think teachers get really bogged down. Yeah, but they can't. Yeah, but they can't. Yeah, but they can't. They can do something independently. Um, I went to observe a child today and she relies a lot on the teacher, but she can read. So let's use the fact that she can read to make her a checklist each lesson so she knows what it is that she needs to do because we can use that. We can use that she can read. Um, we, we, we don't have enough staff. Schools are find staff, staffing really difficult, especially at the moment in the pandemic. But what can we do? Let's be creative. Yes, we're struggling for, for adult support, but what can we do? How can we 
adapt the, the the lesson more how can we adapt the resources that we can have more what support strategies can we use really focusing a and, and you focusing on what is that child able to do and how can I use that to, to fuel them forwards and making that child see what they can what they can do um, and, and really celebrating those successes and those really small steps um, because it, it for special needs children it, it, they, they, the, the gap between them and their peers can can seem so huge so really celebrating those small successes and focusing on where are you and where how can I move you along that ladder is really important can I have the next slide please okay so um, here's an example of um, some strategies that we have in place for a child he is one of our um, most needy child in in school he, his um he, he needs his learning really differentiated for him so each week um his teacher will sit um with his uh one-to-one -one adult and they will put some sessions together we, we keep the timetable the same um in terms of the things that he, he really likes he really likes being outside he's a very physical learner he really likes um noise and counting and and seeing so we're really trying to use those areas to help him in his learning and we will identify times when it um he, he needs to be in the classroom so he'll be in the classroom for those talk for writing sessions or for those counting sessions so he can hear those things that are going on around him it really focuses on where he's at um he is academically really struggles he's in a year one classroom um, but he is performing at the age of an 18 month old so we need to really look at what would an 18 month old be doing and how can we help him move forwards we've got lots of advice in into what we would be doing with him we have speech and language therapists we have a behavior therapist we have an occupational therapist and this is a way that we work within school for some of those children to really tie down what it is that he needs to be doing and breaking the school day down because looking at an hour for him it is too much. So these are activities that he would be doing um, with a one-to-one -one or with the class teacher who will spend time with him when other adults are working with the children or when the children are working on their own. We really advocate teachers working with children with EHCP so their support isn't just delivered by um, a TA. Could we do the next slide, please? Um, visuals are a really good strategy for all types of learners. Um, for your children with EAL, so not necessarily your SEN children, your children for EAL, your children who struggle with reading, your children with autism who have um, strug st struggle structuring things in their head children who have poor working memory so having visuals in as a class is a really great thing um, having visuals at the front or on a washing line for example but also having visuals I, I often talk to teachers about yeah okay it's really great that you've got that number line on the board but that's to the right hand side of them and they're facing forwards let's have a number line for him on his desk on his own and um let's have a really good example of a piece of work that he did last week we've laminated that we photographed it and it's on his table so he's got a really good real life example of what he's doing using word banks so that children can have, have access to that yes there might be one at the front of your class but also having that next to the children can be a really helpful thing and many of these strategies that i'm suggesting aren't just for one type of child so yeah visuals are really good for autistic children but they might also be really good for children with working memory and equally some children with autism haven't got the attention to be looking at some of those visuals so there is no one size fits all it's not every autistic child needs this every child who has adhd needs that every child with dyslexia needs a cover overlay that that that's not the way that it works it's, it's a lot of trial and error and that's sometimes where those outside agencies can support you with that can i have the next slide please okay so as 
strategy that we've been using in school um, many schools are using it now so it might be something that you're using and if you are do tell me in the chat and tell me how it's working for you is the zones of regulation um, it's a program that's really recommended for children who have autism children with speech and language needs children with behavior needs um, and it's a program that helps children to understand and regulate their emotions Welcome to an overview of the zones of regulation. You will learn what they are, why they are important, and how they work. The zones of regulation is a curriculum developed by Lear Kuypers that we will use to help students think and talk about their feelings in order to self-regulate. It is important for children to identify, understand, and respond to emotions in themselves and others. We call this emotional literacy. Children and grown-ups who are emotionally literate have greater academic success, are more focused, better tolerate frustration, get into fewer fights, engage in less self-destructive behavior, are healthier, are less lonely, and less impulsive. We teach the children how their brains and bodies feel when they are experiencing different emotions. When children understand what they are feeling, they can make sense of it and regulate their emotions much better. The four zones help children self-identify how they are feeling and categorize it based on color. Some classes link these to familiar characters in the Disney movie Inside Out to help make it more relatable. No one zone is good or bad, but the green zone is optimal for learning, so we teach the children strategies to get themselves back to the green zone. When you are in the blue zone, you are in a low state of alertness or arousal. You're still in control, but with very low energy emotions. In the green zone, you're in a calm state of alertness. This is predominantly the state you want your child to be in. It's also the state most needed in the classroom in order to learn. In the yellow zone, you have a heightened sense of alertness, but you typically still have some control. You may be frustrated, anxious, or nervous. But it could also mean you're excited, silly, or hyper, which is okay in the right situations. The red zone is an extremely heightened state of intense emotions. When a person reaches the red zone, they are no longer able to control their emotions or reactions. This is the zone kids are in during meltdowns. You're feeling anger, rage, terror, or complete devastation and feel out of control. So what can adults do? Express your own feelings. The larger a child's emotional vocabulary, the better they can communicate with others about their feelings. For example, if the milk spills, you might say, I'm in the yellow zone and I'm feeling frustrated. You made a mess because you were not paying attention. You better take a deep breath and figure out how we can clean it up. You can also label emotions. Mom left on a trip and you're sad. You said you want your mom. You are in the blue zone. Or you might say, playing with your cousin is so much fun. I see you are smiling. Are you happy? You are in the green zone. Along with being able to identify the zones and know what zone they're in, your child also needs to know strategies to help them get back to the green zone. Some strategies we use at school are take five deep breaths, do jumping jacks, ask for a hug, draw a picture, sing the ABCs, Sing the ABCs backwards. Count slowly forwards or backwards. Practicing these strategies while your child is in the green zone will help them learn the best ways to get back there during times when they're feeling stressed, frustrated, or sad. Um, so the Zones of Regulation, it's an American program, hence, hence the American voice. Um, the Zones of Regulation is a, is a really popular program that many specialists will advise um, children to work with. It's something we've now rolled out across the whole school and that lots of children benefit from even though they won't have a special need. Um, it helps identify safeguarding issues and it helps children communicate with staff and we really believe that if we've got all children able to have those possibilities we'll, we'll help all the children within school and we won't be making the children feel so different if they are needing to access those strategies. 
Um, we do have um, children who will have their own independent um, zones of regulation chart on their desk because we recognise that some children flip emotions very quickly within within moments of each other and that they can use that as a way of showing the adults that they are working with how, how they are feeling and we also as a school run zones of regulation sessions so that we've got children that we really identify struggle with this area and need some support with that area so they will come out and ha have a session with an adult once a week for example to develop those skills um, so that's a really interesting program to look at that you, you can learn loads just looking um, on the internet about that program. Uh, YouTube is a, is a really good way forward and it's really, really straightforward to use. And as I say, many schools are using that across the whole school at the moment. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so children who have autism um, will have a diagnosis typically um, from, from the paediatrician. You will also have many children who have many autistic traits within your school and we'll need support with those. So Nicola talked to you about some of those difficulties that children may have. Again, it's one of those areas that I think is so broad, I could talk to you all day for many days about autism and I still wouldn't answer your question because children are so different um, when they have autism. We've, we've got two siblings within the school, one's verbal, one's non-verbal, one is able to 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 spend his day quite independently he doesn't have meltdowns um, and and he's academically able his sibling is is the polar opposite in many ways and you would never sit and think that they had those that that same condition and, and that that's where it's a huge spectrum um, if you've got a question that you wanted to ask about support strategies for autism then please do just put it in the chat and i'll, I'll happily ask you i'll answer it for you um, there's another video I think I'd really like to watch if we can, please, James. My name is Alice, and I want to tell you about how I learn. I go to mainstream school. This is where I learn. It has structure with clear areas where my learning takes place. I like boundaries. There are different parts of the floor where different learning takes place. I also like to learn outdoors. I share my learning space with lots of other children. Sometimes it can get a bit much. My teachers help me when I feel like this. We worked out some ways together, which means I'm able to learn. First, they find a place for me to work, a workstation. My teachers show me my visual timetable. We work together so I can focus on what we're doing. And I can get my reward later. This helps me become independent so I can do my timetable on my own. If I get lost, my teacher uses a check your timetable card. When I know what my teachers want me to do, I go to my workstation, where I can work in my own structured way. With my tasks to do on the left, my workspace in the middle, and my finished work on the right. My teachers help me with my work schedule too. So I know what's going to happen now, next and then. My teacher introduces the schedule 
sometimes reminds me to use it to make sure the tasks are done. My teacher has to remind me less and less. I like it when the tasks are laid left to right and I know that there is a finish. I start with what my teacher calls a posting exercise. After this, we'll make it harder by doing a two-part posting exercise. We also work on matching activities, fine motor skills and lots more. Once the work is finished, we put it in the finished box. I learnt the idea of finished by using my finished box. When I am done, I get my reward. Remember, structured environment, a visual timetable, schedule, and the idea of finished. When all this is done, I get my reward. And next time, I'll do my work to get my reward again. Bye, thank you. Um, I think Kieran, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I think that's a really important question about secondary school settings. Um, you're saying about how, how can you embed some of those things in secondary school settings. I think using some of the principles with, within the video, within the strategies are really important about helping children to build independence, about helping to structure their learning and about helping them to celebrate the things that they can do on their own. I think what I really like in the video that she, the girl talks about working together. So I, I, I think independence is a really important thing in primary schools. That's something that we're trying to really push I've seen a child today with an EHCP and how can we help her be independent? We can help her be independent by having checklists. We can help her be independent by um, really structuring that, the examples around her and putting those systems in place. So I, I completely agree that you, you might not do things at the, the level that they are in that video, but having a simple workstation away from the rest of the children with uh, very minimal distractions, is um, something that can work really well for those children. And again, focusing on what, what can they do and working with the specialists. If, if the child that you're, you're working with is at a GCSE level age and, and they're doing some of those, struggling with some of those areas, that's where those specialists, those um, outside agencies can give you advice on things like how to use checklists, how to use the structure that they have. Uh, I completely agree. Um, workstations can be hard in to have in many different classrooms, but if that's what that child needs, that's where you need to work with with the Senko on, on how can you use that. We have um, uh, workstations within school that, for example, are cardboard um, and a child can carry that from lesson to lesson and, and set it up quite independently and it allows them to, to carry the resources that they need with them and um, setting it up in a place in the classroom that's much less distracting for them. But I, I do agree, it can be challenging. Um, some of the other strategies that you might use for um, children with autism are, are, are ear de defenders. If they find the surroundings really difficult for them to manage, then um, using ear defenders, looking at their sensory needs. You saw in the video, they talked about now and next and really structuring the activities for the children about on a higher level for the children having those really motivating activities yes you're going to do this piece of work but after you've done that you, you can do this task and really focusing on where those children are at and what is it that they they can do and what level are they at and how can you differentiate that and where is it that you want them to get to and what is it that you can do and that is really difficult in a mainstream classroom. And there's the setting um, across education at the moment is, is that children need to have their learning environment within mainstream schools adapted for them. The places in special schools are so few 
that it's a, there's a real focus on what can we do within the mainstream environment for the children and I think that's where helping children to be independent is a really important way forward. Can I have the next slide please? Um, I'm not going to play that video, I, I'm conscious of the time and the other things I wanted to get through, but there's a really nice um, video, a poem, uh, James maybe you could put the link for me in the chat, um, called Hold My Hand, um, Hold My Hand, Come Walk With Me, I want to tell you about ADHD. And it's all about um, understand, helping children, um, understanding children with ADHD. And I think ADHD is one of those conditions that because you can't necessarily see it, people find it really difficult to understand. There is no one size fits all for those children. Um, there's, there's nothing that you can do that will work for every child, but I've just put some examples there for you um, on the screen. So routine works really well for those children um, so they, they, they things are predictable they know what they need to be doing they know what is expected of them we use lots of fidget, fidget toys um, within the classroom so they might be something that the child has around their neck I've got a picture there of a chair band we've got lots of children across the school who struggle to sit still so they have a, a simple band that they put around the bottom of the chair that's something that could be moved um, across classrooms and it helps them to sit and focus because they can move and they can meet that physical need that they have, but it helps them concentrate. Um, and that's less obvious than some of those fidget toys. Those checklists that we've talked about, so that you've got a real example in front of you of what it is that you need to be doing because the children's minds will be jumping around so much often that they will forget. And if you've got a list in front of you, you need to write the title, you need to write the date, you need to write, read page 12, you need to answer those six questions and have that written down in a list. That negates the need for a teaching assistant to be sitting next to them, that's there um, in front of them to, to do that. Those um, workstations that we talked about in that video a moment ago can be really helpful sitting away from distractions so that you can the, the children can focus that might be sitting at a workstation, that might be sitting at the front of the classroom where you've not got all that visual input going on. And again, really focusing on what it is that that child can do. So do they need to sit and order all the little cards in front of you or could they find a bigger space around the classroom and have A4 pieces of paper that they need to be moving around so that you're taking away that need for them to be sitting still. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? OK, so some resources that you can use, um, including things for dyslexia and dyspraxia. Um, so I've got some examples there of checklists. Um, they might be laminated. Teachers will say they always forget at the end of the day what five things they need to take home that night. So that they have a laminated checklist that they tick off. We've got children with um, photographs on their lockers of the things that they need to be putting in that locker. Um, simple things like writing slopes and wobble cushions and pencil grips can really help children with dyspraxia to help develop those motor skills. Um, children having sessions on their own or with an adult to develop those motor skills. If they've got really poor handwriting, just flogging away at their handwriting might not necessarily be the answer to that. You, 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 you need to give them time to develop that skill. So that is a, is a worthwhile activity for them to spend five minutes doing at the beginning of the lesson. Um, looking at the books that the children are working in, so we've got children who work with um, really bold lines in their books so they can see much clearer where it is they're supposed to be working or highlighted pages within their books. So yes their books will look different but it, what it means is that they're able to structure their work a lot better and they're able to be able to focus on the handwriting because it's very clearly laid out where they're working. Overlays can be really good for children um, with dyslexia um, and will help, can help children. You can um, buy the, the colour overlays and as a school you can do an assessment or other agencies can do assessments for you. You can have those as a whole overlay. Um, as a teacher, thinking about if a child um, really works well with a red overlay, for example, when you're doing your presentation on the board, having the background colour always being red rather than the white is, is a useful strategy to use. You can also get reading rulers 
where the children, it, it was a see-through area where the children can really just focus on that, that line. So they're not seeing the whole page, they're just seeing that line of text. Um, word banks are really important to you so the children aren't, the children have got examples in front of them and um, they're not necessarily focusing on how to spell that word, they're focusing on, on using that word so that that's there in front of them and there's a reminder. Can I have the next slide please? Um, so some other interventions that you, you might well offer beyond the resources, um, really looking at that whole child um, is what I'm thinking there and some of the other needs. Many children um, who might have autism or ADHD will have some other needs alongside that. So thinking about what is it that that child is struggling with and how can we support that? So counselling, um, for example, we pay for a, a school counsellor. We have somebody who comes in. We also engage with agencies like CAMH um, and CHUMS, and they will support children directly. As a school, we offer mentoring to children and we have staff trained in drawing and talking and play therapy. Looking at the wider needs of the child, um, we deliver social skills sessions. We deliver um, structured play sessions and zones of regulation sessions so we can really focus on the wider needs of that child. And we really advocate peer support for children. And I think that's such an important way of supporting children, moving away from that um, model of this is my, my less able table. These are the children who, who, who really struggle and I'm gonna put them all together in one group. What is it that the peers next to them can offer support on? and how um, that modelling of really higher level language can support those children push forwards and using those children who are more able to support them, which also embeds and supports the learning of those higher attainer children and has proven to be of the support to them. And then we also offer sessions, um, toe by toe sessions or power by two sessions. So, for a child who really is struggling with their basic English, giving them some really intensive support on their basic English at their level can be really important um, to support them and build them up with the aim that you would then be removing that support at some time when, when you filled that gap. Um, can I have the next slide, please? I would say that when you've got resources in place for children or when you've got successful strategies in place for children, really think about the impact that they're having and really think about removing them from the child. Um, the great one that I always hear is just because a child can see, when a child can see with glasses, you don't then take away their glasses because they need them. That's what's helping them to see. So I, I don't advocate having children in intervention groups their whole academic life. But if a chair band is really helping that child to focus and concentrate, don't just think, oh, well, I can take the chair band away now because they can focus and concentrate. That chair band might be what's helping them. That workstation that they're work really working at independently, yes, it might be difficult to um, have that set up in the classroom, but if that's what helps them, think carefully about removing that from them as you would other strategies. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so there's an article, I'm conscious of the time. Um, James, could you put that article for me in um, the chat so teachers can read that afterwards? I think the one thing that I'd really be saying about um, the use of TAs is they're a really great source of support for children if they are used in the right way and so that's a really good article that I is, is there for you to see um, about how we use TAs and making sure that TAs are used to develop independence and are used correctly so that girl in the video that we watched she talked about we work together she helps me too I think with a lot of children, then you can develop learned helplessness. So teaching assistants really need to spend time focusing on what can I do to support this child to be independent? And that article talks about moving away from the Velcro model that 
model that you 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 still see especially for children with ehcps where i've got to sit next to you you can't move without me doing this for you i'm going to help you turn the page in your book i'm going to help you do all of these things and you have teach children who say i can't do that because mrs so and so is not with me today and they they sit there really unsure of what to do i think tas are really good at coming in setting a child up here's here's your checklist here's your timer here's the right page of your book off you go i'll be back in five minutes and off they go and, and and help someone else and i think it's really important that teaching assistants help teachers to work with children so what you you have had situations in the past where because the children can't work on their own effectively teach children with special needs are, are taught by the teaching assistants because the teaching assistants are with them all the time I think it's really important that teachers make sure that they spend time with the children who have the highest need within the classroom teaching assistants can help facilitate that by working with some of the other children and doing some of that live feedback and things like that but the teaching assistants I think needs to, it needs to be really planned how they are going to support the children within your classroom and how they can support children's independence rather than creating this learned helplessness um, that many children have really focusing on what support do I need to give to that teaching assistant what training do they need I want them to deliver this maths intervention do they know how to do that do they know what that intervention looks like do they know the knowledge that they need to be imparting do they have that knowledge themselves so teaching assistants are really useful if they are used in the right way many teachers will tell you that they can't live without their teaching assistants and and, and they are such an important part of school i think you just need to really think about how you use them properly to get to to get the best out of them and that article there is, is a really good way of helping you think about that um, can I move on to the last slide, please? Uh, I apologise because the title of this slide is wrong. So it's not um, about teaching assistants. That was the previous slide. This is about support for teachers. So I just wanted to, as my last thing, highlight for you some um, helpful um, places that you might be able to find support for you to develop your knowledge and understanding. Um, many of these can be found on Facebook. Um, so SEM Buddy, Send Station, deliver some really good cheap training, virtual training um, on different areas of special needs um, that can really help upskill some TAs. The ADHD Foundation is a really good um, network of support for children with ADHD. There's an article there, a handbook at the bottom there with a link of supporting children with ADHD in education. So if you wanted to, to copy that, there's a um, that, that one there at the bottom is about ADHD. Speech and Language Service have got a really good website. They put some really good um, tips on there and really good resources for you. Autism Bedfordshire for people who are in Bedfordshire and Luton have some really good support ideas and strategies and can signpost you and there's just a um, send teacher handbook there um, from Nathan that is a really good um, support strategy for you to use in the classroom um, and, and to give you the way forwards. If you've got any questions then please do feel free to ask them. I know that's a really whistle-stop tour of support strategies for special needs I'd be more than happy to um, talk to you further if there's anything I can do. I'd really say, I'd really advocate getting to know the child, thinking about where it is you want them to go, what is the barrier and what is it that you can do to help remove that barrier. And the best way of doing that is by knowing the children, by spending time with them and by working with them and being creative. I think in, in the educational climate that we're in, resources are, are, are harder and harder, physical resources, staff resources, they're harder and harder to come by. So really getting to know the children and being creative is really important. Thank you all very much for joining me and your time. And as I say, please feel free to send any questions. Um, I don't know if they can send those questions to you, James, or anything that you wanted to do.
I've got a few seconds uh, or minutes or so. So what I'll do is if anyone wants to pose any questions, feel free still to pop those into the chat if you'd like to um, pose those to Coralie and then obviously she'll be able to pick those up and I'll just sort of um, go through a couple of sort of wrapping up bits. I think firstly, some really, really sort of helpful uh, looking back over my practice as a teacher. There are so many things that I can see where in my classroom I could have perhaps done some things differently perhaps, but equally how you might employ a load of those strategies, both you know, at a secondary phase, equally how they work in a, in a primary phase as well. And I think it's really good sometimes even just to get those takeaway sort of bits. Um, I, I will share obviously the links and so forth um, with the recording. I'll post those in the comments so people can uh, catch up with those as well. So just to recap that this session uh, has been recorded, will be posted on our YouTube page so you'll be able to catch up and revisit any of the sort of sections if you wanted to look over. And I think, you know, touching base on some of those videos as well, really sort of, um, useful sort of tidbits that we can take away with us as well. So if it is a case that you've got questions and you think about something later on, by all means, feel free to reach out on Twitter. Um, you'll be able to find us sort of fairly easily. There's lots of posts that have come out over the past week or so about the session, and you can reply to any of those and tag us in. Um, if there are uh, no questions coming through, um, nothing but to say uh, thank you, Coralie, for the sort of really insightful tips and so forth as well. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening. No problem. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Bye.